Uh, we do live in anxious times, don't we? Um, there's financial uncertainty, there's anxiety all around the world with significant inflation levels, interest rates on, uh, rates on the rise, inflation going up higher, difficult to afford things, and all those things that makes us uncertain as individuals. There's uncertainty in the world with wars, there's Russia and Ukraine, there's Israel and the Palestinians, there's rumours of wars between many nations, including China and Taiwan. Political uncertainty around the globe, and even a former US President Donald Trump uh, in danger of going to prison, in real danger of that. And yet, ironically, when you talk about those things, those topical things, the opening slide that we have there is, shows quite a different picture, doesn't it? It's something that everybody wants, aspires to, um, prays for, and that's they want what Americans call the great American dream. They want the good life. <clears throat> Everybody's searching for it, trying to live it, trying to find it, they might find the good life. And so we ask ourselves, well, what is the good life? What is it? And I suppose those pictures show it for you. We'll show a few more, more pictures as well. What is a good life? Well, they refer to it as healthy eating is a good life. Healthy foods to prolong good life. Get your backyard back in order. Backyard sustainability, they call it. Get all your veggie patch in order and, and all the fruits and veggies that you can to, to sustain a good life. So healthy eating is one of them. Healthy living and exercise is another one. And, and you look at all the uh, different plans that uh, people have, centres to help get you back in shape. Even 30 minutes a day is enough to help you have, enjoy the good life and good health uh, till an old age. <clears throat> uh, even here in Adelaide, we have the Good Life Health Centres. They're actually there. You can actually drive past them and, and obviously got a few photos of them as well. You can ride any one of multiple bikes or any one of many walkers and there's bench presses and the, lift, the list goes on. And if you go past early in the morning, past a Good Life Health Club, there's usually 100 people inside all going their hardest to whatever music they play. Uh, they go to work and it's a good life. Maybe something I need to take a bit more heed of, and that's financial uh, good life. I'm not very good at my finances. But you can get the financial good life, getting your wealth in order, getting everything ready so when you're retired, uh, you can have a fantastic uh, retirement and live the good life uh, with plenty of money flowing even though you're not working anymore. <clears throat> Even your pets can have the good life. You can, there's a recipe of the good life dog food and your little Fido or whatever his name is, if you can cook it up and he gets the good life as well. And this world is pushing uh, the good life around us in all the irony and of the uncertainty and the anxiety that we live in. Even our pets can have the good life if they eat this type of recipe. So when we add this all up and we, we look at this picture there, well, this is the good life and this is the life. And we say that ourselves, don't we? If we're sitting by a river about this time of year, uh, with our feet paddling in the Murray River, uh, which of course we can't next weekend, but if, if we do, we sit there and we just say, oh, this is the good life. Especially if we've got a can of Coke on one side or a cup of coffee on the other side. And we think to ourselves, well, we don't have these things. Uh, we don't have the good life. It's a bad life. And so the world is teaching us to aspire to have the best of this, the best of that, possessions, holidays, money, or all pictures is giving us the peace and serenity to have a good life. And you have these things in your life, you'll be much better off for it. Is that the Bible's perspective? <clears throat> Can you get the good life today? Well, let's look at some Bible basics on this subject. Um, we have Ecclesiastes. Um, the context is fabulous. Where it says no one really knows what is a good life for a man in this life. And that is the context of gaining many riches, having many children that... Early in, the, in Ecclesiastes 6, you can have 100 children and pretend that you've got the good life. I'm not sure why 100 children be the good life. Uh, four, enough, four is enough for us. But that's a context. You have all the riches in the world, but once you're dead, that's it. Um, you can't take it with you. It's not necessarily the good life, is it? Such effort goes into these things in life, but we still die. And the question of, of the writer of Ecclesiastes was, what was all the effort? The vanity and vexation of spirit. Uh, we have in Genesis, we all know Genesis 1. And chapter 3, Adam and Eve had a very good life. Very good. It was great. Uh, they could have had everlasting life. Uh, but it didn't work out that way, did it? They sinned when they ate of that wrong fruit. And the consequences, we suffer every day. We were afflicted by the consequences of what Adam and Eve did uh, 6,000 years ago. <clears throat> in Exodus, the law of Moses promised long life in the land. And that quote there is in the context of the Ten Commandments. We've all heard the Ten Commandments. And uh, the context of the, this one was a tenth commandment. And the tenth commandment was, uh, thou shalt not covet. <laughs> we all break that one. Uh, we all covet. We all want something better. Uh, we all want something greater than next door, or definitely in my case, a, a car that's better than the one before, <laughs> if it's breaking down all the time. 
And we all covet in some way, so we're never going to get long life in the land because we, we all break at least the 10th commandment. <clears throat> Proverbs says a virtuous woman can provide a good life. And if you go through the list of all those characteristics in Proverbs 31, that's impossible. My wife would get pretty close to that, but it's impossible. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing list. It's difficult to do that. No one gets that. Sorry for any ladies here. Um, but it's impossible because we're all sinners. We all fall short of God's glory. It's impossible to have that, no matter how much you aspire or try to do that. Uh, in Proverbs, that's the ideal. If you can have the ideal, uh, well done. Uh, but generally, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, First to Peter says, refraining the tongue from evil and guile can provide good days. First to Peter 3 and verse 10. Watching how we speak can provide good days. And that's an excellent prerequisite to having life. But it's only if the hearer is receptive and does it as well. You can say all the nicest things in the world, but if the other person is repeating back to you the opposite, then it's not a good life. Uh, it's horrible to hear those things. And of course, we've also got... Um, Psalm 128 says that children provide a good life and happy is a man that has his quiver full of them, lots of them. Maybe he's referring to the hundred that uh, Ecclesiastes was talking about. So children can offer a good life and they do and it is fabulous at times. And no offence to the children that are here but sometimes children can be your hardest trials as well. Your biggest difficulties in life as well, especially when they go through the teenage years. And while children may not realise it, sorry children, uh, but sometimes you go to bed at night thinking, I had a great day. Your, your parents go to bed chewing off all their fingernails for what's happened that day. And then you move on the next day as well. And so the Bible has um, plenty of lessons there which shows that, well, you don't necessarily get the good life today. Uh, what we have today is as good as what it gets, if you like. But let's develop this a little bit further. In Proverbs chapter 3, which we read tonight, uh, it's fabulous as it is, and thanks, Tim, for reading all of it. Just the first few verses um, we're going to spend a little bit of attention to. There's some godly advice from the Proverbs. God wrote the Bible. It's his advice. It's Solomon writing and he says in verse 1, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. And so he says in verse 2, For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. So here's a, a proverb about having long life, maybe good life. But it comes with conditions and it's a father teaching his son. It's Solomon teaching his son. Uh, it's God teaching his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, if you like, as well. And so it's, it says, well, if you keep all my commandments, you can have length of days. You can have peace. You can have that serenity. You can have a good life. So then long life, then, number one, is not about riches. It's not about wealth. It's not about fitness and holidays and uh, good life dog biscuits and all those things. Uh, good life is about high virtues. It's about keeping God's commandments. And there's not one person upon this globe who has ever been able to do that except for the Lord Jesus Christ. And those virtues continue in the next few verses. Uh, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. So here's a commandment he says to keep, mercy and truth. Bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favour and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Uh, that's a great life you can have if you can keep those things, mercy and truth, and keep the commandments of God. And so verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So trusting in God is far more important. And so we see biblically, um, quite in a real way, that it is impossible to have that sort of good life that people are striving for today. The Bible is real. There's a reality about it. But... As we're going to show, as we keep on going, there is a better life to come. Uh, if you were to read through the rest of Proverbs chapter 3, it is fabulous. It personifies wisdom. And I've got a lot of highlighting in this chapter, which talks about how great God's wisdom is, particularly in the middle of this chapter. But let's just go a bit further on in Proverbs and just give you a few other quotes. So there's our 3, verse 3 and 4 from another translation. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them about your neck. Uh, write them on the tablet of your heart. So deep down here in your heart, that's where they must be. And you will find favour and good success in the sight of God and man. Some more godly advice from the Proverbs. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Uh, and that's great medicine, isn't it? Uh, and maybe that needs to be taught a bit more in this world in which we live, when there's a lot of anxiety. Proverbs 4, verse 14 to 15. Do not enter the path of the wicked. Do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away and, 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 um, from it and pass on. I, mean, I break that in my own life. And, and I have struggles with that myself. 
And, and the godly advice is keep away from evil, run away from it, uh, avoid it, don't look at it, and keep away. And we struggle with that one. Uh, Proverbs 21, verse 13 Whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. And so if we struggle to help those in need, why isn't that help going to come back our way as well? And there's some godly advice from God in, in the Proverbs. Whosoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness and honour. And as you can see, as, as we're going to go through the night, I mean, if the world was to teach these things, if they were to be legislated in the Australian government or any other government around the world, how much a better world this place would be. It would be a great place to live and potentially you could have the good life where everybody's respecting each other, everybody's helping each other. There is no wicked and we're all doing God's commandments. A couple more Proverbs because Proverbs is good. Um, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches and favour is better than silver or gold. Uh, this is better to be known for something good rather than to have great riches and favour of men for how great you are in that sense. Listen to advice, accept instruction, that you may gain wisdom in the future. So listen to God's advice. Listen to his instruction, accept his wisdom. Make it change your life uh, for good. Proverbs 10 verse 4, a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent uh, makes rich. So the hand of the diligent helps others, whereas a slack hand uh, causes poverty. So uh, if you're like me and you've got a brown thumb and not a green thumb, well, my veggie patch would die. It, it wouldn't survive. But if, if I was diligent, um, I could do a lot better. And of course, Proverbs 16, verse 32, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. So better to control your own nature, your own actions, your own thoughts, than someone who's taken a whole city. And you can apply that to any great person in, in the past, Napoleon and, and those sorts of people who were able to conquer cities, Alexander the Great, and so on. Uh, they're not as good as someone who can control their own anger, control their own spirit. They are better than a mighty person. Might have all the strict strategical prowess, have little numbers and defeat larger numbers, but you're not as good as someone who can control, one single person who can control their own heart. And that's the, the practical advice from Proverbs. And you can go through the Proverbs. There's Proverbs about wisdom. There's Proverbs about fools. There's Proverbs about pride, anger, self-control. There's Proverbs about the tongue, about business, about friendships, about home life, and about kindness. You know, that list must be given to our Prime Minister here in Australia. I'm not sure what he'll be able to do with that because politics is politics. And uh, I don't think it would work too well with the Australian populace. But I think we'd all agree how much better would uh, the world be if we lived this, our, our, our own communities, our own council areas, our own states, our own nation and the world at large, if we could practice a few more of God's principles. And that's God's godly advice. So then how important is God's advice? Well, it's easy to quote it. Uh, how seriously should we take these? I mean, yes, they're great words. Well, let's look at God, what God says about his advice. So there's, sorry for those taking notes. <laughs> You're going to get another slide. Ready, set, bang, you've got it. This is how God's advice on how he thinks his advice is. So God is sovereign. God created all things. This is how important his, he says his advice is. There are many devices in man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. The word counsel there means advice, plan or purpose. So we live in a world that's full of many different devices. Inventions, plans, technology, centres that they might think are definitive. But rather it's only God's advice that really matters. And God says, my advice that matters above all these things. You can have all these other bits of technology. You can Google up anything or if in America they, they ask Siri everything. It's God's advice that's more important than anything. And the word stand there at the end of that verse uh, means to rise or to continue. So it's God's advice will help you to continue in life more than anything else that man can devise. Uh, Proverbs 8 verse 14 says the same thing. Counsel is mine. It's all God's. No self-help book will help you like God's Bible can. Counsel is mine. Sound wisdom. I am understanding, I have strength. The word sound wisdom there means support or ability. And there's great support in God's word if we take advice to it. And also Proverbs 9 and 10 and verse 20. Hear counsel, receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. So, so it doesn't matter how much knowledge or wisdom or how great of a job you might have in life. It doesn't matter how high up the tree that you went in life. 
uh, in your job. What really matters towards your latter end is how much of this book you got into your brain and how much it affected your life. And I'll say that again, it's very important. As your life gets older, it becomes, what, what's most important is how much this went into our heads and how much we practised it in life. Because as the previous proverb says, put it around your heart. It's got to be in there, right there in your heart. It's no good just being in the head, it's got to be in the heart because that affects your actions. That's God's advice, that's what God says can help you in some way to have a good life despite all the adversity, all the anxiety, all the stress that is all around it. It's God's wisdom, it's God's advice, God's instruction. It'll make us wise even till the very end of our lives. In other words, you can be like Tutankhamun and you can be buried with all your wealth, uh, with all your wealth, um, but it, it didn't help him, did it? He died at a young age because everybody else wanted his wealth. Uh, you can be like Bill Gates, who founded Microsoft. He might, he might be one of the biggest philanthropists in this earth. His inventions are seen in everyday life. It's seen on my computer here. It's seen on everything that's got a computer chip. Everything that's got an operating system or a computer chip in some way has been influenced by him. Has that made us any better? Has it made life any better? Has it made us any wiser, any happier, any wealthier? No. We just become more greedy, more selfish, less helpful to others. We still have trial, we still have anxiety, and we still have stress. So what is the difference there between man's advice and God's advice? Man who's striving to get that good life and God's advice in the Bible. Man's advice may seem to give a good life now. It may seem to. Uh, and you can walk away happy from a fitness centre. Uh, you can walk away happy when your dog eats his good life biscuits and, he, and, he's, and he's a happy chappy. Uh, it, it might be happy times in life and, and, and it's good to have those moments where we can laugh and enjoy people's company. But God's advice gives realism to life now and a better life tomorrow. Because in the end, as much as man might strive to have a good life, there are still wars, there are still anxieties, there's still stress. There is no such thing as a good life. A better time is coming. And God will set up a far better place upon this earth uh, one day, and we believe as Christadelphians that day is coming soon. We can't wait for it. We live and breathe for that day. So the realism, realism to life now is about being content with what we have. Serve God the best we can, the God of all things, the God who has made all things, the God who sustains all things, that when he sends his son, Jesus Christ, to the earth, we may be a part of that future. So the realism to this life is that it's not always easy. And God's advice is that, well, trial is something that, that is helpful in life. Uh, it moulds our characters, it benefits us, and it also benefits others. And so 1 Peter 1 verse 7 says, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And so while the world searches for the good life, uh, we know that the good life is coming and every day we're being matured by the trials that come our way. Uh, completely out of context is the Job quote, but the same principle nonetheless when Job said, But he knoweth the way that I take, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job said that quite arrogantly, of course, but it's the same principle. Uh, that when we are tried, uh, we can come forth as gold, as it removes all the impurities uh, that afflicts us every day in our life. Now, we don't want to finish on a negative note, of course. Uh, we'd like to finish by spending some time uh, that we have left on some of God's advice. And if utilised, this earth would be a much better place for all the peoples on it. If they practiced it. There are many surveys about Bible quotes. Um, you can actually Google it. It's quite fabulous to Google it and have some fun. And uh, there are many surveys that have been done. Um, surveys about what's the top five quotes about friendship in the Bible? What's the top 10 quotes about comfort in the Bible? What's the top 20 inspiring quotes in the Bible? And you can do that. And one of those surveys, um, which I looked at about 10 years ago now, was what was one of the top 10 quotes that could give us a good life today? And there was a, a survey that actually did that. And everybody around the globe over a certain period of time put in what their top 10 quotes were for a good life, and they came up with the 10 that we're going to look at uh, uh, very shortly. Now, normally, you would actually do it in 10 down to 1, 1 being the greatest, 10 being the not-so-greatest, even though it's fabulous anyway. Uh, we're going to do it the other way around. Uh, the first one, number 1 first, and then down to 10. 
Now, if I was to ask you what your top 10 quotes would be for life today and how you could uh, get through life as best as possible, looking forward to a better one, you might have different to this. Uh, but you would know every single one of these, and uh, they are fabulous quotes, every single one. The first one was, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. That was number one in the survey of quotes that can give a good life today. And you think about that quote. How fabulous would that be if every single individual upon the face of this earth uh, practiced that? There'd be no more murder. There'd be no more theft. Uh, covetousness and the like because we're all inspired by one individual God who made all things and we loved him with the whole heart, mind, soul and strength. And added to that, of course, uh, Luke adds, and loving thy neighbour uh, as thyself. And so God has made all individuals, if we could practice that and love our neighbour, our friends, our fellows, as much as we love our God, how fabulous would this world be if we, if we practice that? Do you imagine if that happened in this world or in this country, in our own neighbourhoods, uh, our own our parents who are getting old now had to put in video surveillance around their house because of well, people walking around and trying to break into their car early in the morning. Imagine everyone just loved God and didn't want to do that and they were thankful. Now these are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not just God's advice, it's Christ's advice. It's the advice of his son who was crucified unjustly for our salvation. And if he went through what he did unjustly and died, uh, what can we go through in life when we have that example before us? My number two wouldn't have been this one, but um, this is the number two. Um, A great quote from Matthew 4, verse 4, where Christ said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that's the words of the Lord Jesus Christ as well. Now, there's so much information that you can get in a a news agent. Um, or a newspaper. You can go online, you can search it all online, find out everything that you want to online. There's so much information out there. But there is no information like God's word. It is timeless. It's for every single generation. Uh, I nearly thought about, I got four slides on general day-to-day quotes that we quote today. They're all from the Bible. There's about a hundred of them. And you just go through the list after list of things that we say today all actually came from the Bible. Because God's word is timeless. And uh, we quote it more than what we do, and so does the world around us. And it's time it's can be used for any generation to help. And so the Lord says it's important that you live by God's word, not just necessarily by the bread or healthy living uh, that the world says can create a good life. <clears throat> Number three, a quote from Micah. Amen. Oh, you show thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? Uh, To do justly there means to show justice in our dealings with each other. You imagine if Russia did this at the moment with Ukraine and had a big uh, about face and said, no, actually, we've been completely unjust in this. We're going to change tune here and we're going to do good to Ukraine. We're going to send out relief packages over there. Uh, They can't bring back to life anybody who's died. But but imagine if they did that and said, well, Micah 6 verse 8 says, uh, do justly. That's what God requires. That's what God wants. And they did that. How much? Uh, would it just ease attention around the world in which we live? Loving mercy, another one. Walking humbly with thy God as well. Walking humbly with God or walking with God means to be in tune with God. Imagine if the whole world was in tune with him. It means to be in tune with him means to walk at his pace. It means to walk on his pathway. It means to love his principles. And humbly means appreciating his greatness that we are men. God's greater than us and and we are men and we're we're humble in his presence and yet we want to walk in his ways. And Micah says there's three things that you need in life to to serve him and that came in as number three on the all-time quotes of having a good life. And it wouldn't be good if we had that in legislation today. And the Australian Parliament said we're just going to throw out everything and let's just put those three principles in legislation, in our constitution. How much better would Australia be? We owe God everything. We live and move and have our being in God. He owes us nothing, but he promises us, promises us everything. The next one is a really good principle for life. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, number 4. Whatsoever thy hand finds to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. You imagine if that was everybody's principle when they got up in the morning and went off to work. And the ones who didn't go to work, if they did find a job and use that advice. 
there'd be no corruption, there'd be no unemployment, there'd be no theft, stealing, no breaking into shops and people's homes, there'd be no, no people living on cars, on streets. Uh, we've been to Los Angeles a few times, there'd be no people living in tents. You can, go th you can walk through the streets of Hollywood and it's like tent city, people living in tents in one of the richest places in the world. There'd be no doll system, no crime at late at night. Everybody would be working and everybody would be working diligently and giving their boss even more just the eight hours that is required. Imagine if we did that. Imagine if teenagers did that when they were asked to clean their rooms <laughs> and many other things as well. I'll get to it one day, but the principal of Ecclesiastes, I'll do it straight away and put in every bit of effort that I can. Number five, this is fabulous, and this is actually quoted by the world many times over. Uh, Therefore, all things whatsoever you do, uh, you would that men should do to you, do ye even do so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So, so the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking here, said, it is set in time past, I'm going to repeat it again so you don't miss out the point. Whatever you want people to do to you, do it back to them, reciprocate back to them as well. Uh, we teach this to our children from a very young age, don't we? Uh, we teach our children to be nice to other children and they'll be nice back. Uh, we teach it uh, as we get older as well. And if we did that, there'd be no more bullying. There'd be more respect amongst countries and even amongst neighbours and even amongst families and, and amongst children. Whatever you want done to you, do it back to them as well. That came in number five uh, in the list of all-time quotes for living a good life and how good would life be if we all just had that principle. We'd all be doing good uh, to each other. Uh, among the same principle, of course, is, is this one in Acts, which is a fabulous quote, where it's, it's Paul saying, I have showed you all things, how that so labouring you ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And you'll actually not find that quote in the Gospels. Uh, the principle is there, but you'll actually not find that quote word for word. It's something that Christ must have told Paul at some stage. And Paul said that to the Ephesian Ecclesia, where he was at in, in, Ex, uh, sorry, in, in Acts chapter 20. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, we have many philanthropists in this world. Bill Gates, which I quoted earlier. Uh, there's many others uh, uh, as well that we have even in, in Australia as well. Um, many people who have lots of money and, and give money out. Um, a lot of the reason they do that is because it saves them taxes as well. But that, that's another side issue, of course, isn't it? And, but... Is selfishness any less in this world because of it? You know, the more money that gets handed out by government, the more people want, isn't it? it, it we give handouts in Australia and the, the de next day the newspaper clipping says that well, that was not enough. Well, there's another group of people that missed out. You know, we have particular days here in Australia and all around the world in order for, to, for people to show thankfulness. We have days like Father's Days and we had Mother's Days just to tell people to be thankful. Just one day a year, you can be thankful to your father or to your mother. Imagine if every day was like that, and that's what Paul is saying. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And imagine if that spirit was there every, in every city around the world, in every community. You'd be receiving more presents than what you give out. There'd be no more unthankfulness, no more, unselfish, uh, no more selfishness. Everybody would be content in giving at the same time. They came in as number six. Number seven. This would have been higher on my list, but it came in as number seven. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And the context of all these things is, is, is all the, the mundane things of life. If you have your focus on the kingdom and God's righteousness, God will sort out the rest. You don't have to be anxious for what, uh, for, for what your needs are in life. God will supply this is the hope of every Christadelphian. We all hope for this. It inspires us. It motivates us. Uh, it challenges us. Uh, it gives us vision for the future. That's why we're here tonight. God has a plan for the earth. We want to be part of it. Uh, it makes us live a better life. It makes us practice godly principles as best we can. And we can't wait for that kingdom to come. It inspires us in life. But added to that, not just the kingdom of God, we seek his righteousness. So seek first the kingdom and his right. So first is up there with uh, God's righteousness is up there with God's kingdom. The word um, his righteousness means we seek his favour or his justification. Yes, it's one thing to want a kingdom and a better place to live in. 
But it's another to want God's favour and to please him. We seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. We want to please God. Number one in life is to please our God and to gain his favour. Because as children don't like to upset their parents when they do something wrong, we don't like to upset our God in heaven. Number eight on the list is a quote from Ecclesiastes. It's a final quote, isn't it? In, In Ecclesiastes, let us hear the conclusion of the matter. As he summed up his book in Ecclesiastes, a final quote is... Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Our whole duty, according to Solomon, is this. Keep God's commandments. And some of those commandments we've seen tonight, haven't we? Some of those principles in Proverbs that we've seen about truth and justice and mercy and some of those other, uh, the first seven top quotes that we've seen. Now, it's God's counsel. It's his advice. It's his wisdom. Uh, Today we have so many laws and jurisdictions. You get out the Australian Constitution and it's so thick it's not funny. And you need another book even thicker to be able to understand the Constitution. And we have so much red tape and fees in councils uh, because of corruption. Imagine a world that just did everything God's way. And one day that's going to happen. Everything is going to be done God's way and everybody keeping God's command. That's the whole conclusion of the matter. And we're going to live shortly in a world where everybody does that. Imagine if it was like that today. This one here never made it to my top ten list, but it's in the top ten list, and, it's, and I'm glad it's there. It's a quote in Philippians uh, 4 and verse 8, where it says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. The word think right at the end there in Philippians 4 verse 8 is a Greek word logizomai, which we get the word logic from. It actually means to take an inventory, to estimate or to conclude. Yeah, well, actually, how does that make sense? How do we estimate these things or conclude these things? Well, another writer actually says it actually means to, to take a stamp upon those things. Therefore, what it means is every time we make a decision or every time we, we make a thought, we need to go back and stamp off whether it was according to this list. So we get to the end of the day and uh, we might have had some difficult decisions to make. Can we stamp off, did I do everything that was truthful today? Did I do everything that was honourable today? Did I do everything that was equitable today? Was it pure? Was it friendly? That's the word, the word lovely, that means friendly. Well, if it wasn't, then change. You know, the opposite to those things are, uh, was it truthful? Well, that's compared to being a lie or dishonest. Was I dishonest today? Was it honourable what I did today? Or that's compared to being corrupt. Was I corrupt and took a bit on the side and ripped someone off? Was it equitable compared to being unjust? Were the balances far more weight in my favour than someone else's? Was it pure? Or did you do it with the wrong motive? Was it friendly or was it done out of spite? You know, imagine if we all thought that way and we could all stamp off at the end of the day that we did those things that way and how much of a better world it would be. You imagine if NATO or even our local council got together and took an inventory of the day's efforts and all their thinking, all their decisions they made and said, yep, we can stamp off Philippians 4 verse 8, we did it all that way. And we know that's impossible, don't we? Because we struggle in our own very own lives to do it as well. But how much more of a pleasure would this world be to live in if we all practised those things and then stamped them off because we we did it? Number 10. This would have been my second, by the way, but I'm glad it made it to number 10. And it's quite pertinent, really, that it does finish off the top 10 in some ways. Uh, For even here unto where you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Now, we follow Christ's steps. That's our motivation. That's our goal. We have a vision in front of us, and we follow the one uh, who we want to be there with, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we follow him as if we're actually walking behind him, walking in his very own feet where he stood and where he walked. And what it means, in other words, that our life should be a resemblance or the closest imitation to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the following verses of Peter actually tell you what they were, and which I don't have on the screen, but it says, we know that, especially those who have been to Heritage, where it says, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. 
who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, gave his whole commitment uh, in his life to his God, despite the, the difficulties in being crucified completely unjustly uh, before men. You know, there's so, so much litigation today, isn't there? I read once many years ago that someone tried to sue McDonald's in Sydney because as they walked past McDonald's on the pavement, they slipped on an ice cream. That ice cream was dropped by another patron's child. It wasn't McDonald's fault, it was someone else's fault, but McDonald's got sued for it. And that just happens time and time again. Uh, in America, when, you, when you're over there, you see billboards up there of lawyers offering uh, their support uh, that you can be financially gained for anything that you've been wrong for in life. And all through Los Angeles, the billboards everywhere, it's absolutely amazing in this litigious society we live. But imagine if we followed in Christ's steps, who had every litigious reason to complain about what was given him. And he did no sin. There was no guile found in his mouth. And that made the top ten of principles, if we could live by, could have a good life. And of course, that's conditional upon everybody else doing it. And that doesn't happen, does it? And that's why we as Christadelphians look forward to a far greater world uh, coming soon when Jesus Christ does return back to this earth. And you would agree with me that this world does need changing. We do need a breath of fresh air. We do need godly principles practised on this earth. And that day is coming soon. Uh, may these quotes and many more, maybe you can share with me afterwards some more quotes that you would add to your top 10 or make it top 20, there's so many. Uh, Let's take to heart these things and make sure that we practice them now. Share it to those around us. Uh, these quotes and many more are the advice of the God of heaven who made everything. He promises a far better life to come if we practice these things. If the world did, every government, every politician, everything constituted in this world would be, it'd be a far different place. Let's practice what we can today. Do what we can today. Let's, every individual, take to heart God's advice and prepare for his kingdom and glory.